Clothing, by and large, provides a form of extra protection for the body. Outerwear can give us extra warmth or prevent clothes underneath from being soaked through in wet weather, while underwear can also provide an extra layer, helping to trap warm air between layers. It also stops your outer clothes from rubbing or irritating the body. Underwear has changed a lot over the centuries, especially for women, but outerwear as a concept is a bit more recognisable. Styles and fashions change, but the general principle behind outerwear largely doesn't. Unsurprisingly, both are also subject to a range of superstitions themselves, so let's cover these last two parts of the clothing puzzle in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I do hope that you're enjoying February. Right as I'm recording this, it's at the start of half term, which means that I get to have a week off, which is much needed, let me tell you. It's also incredibly windy outside, so I'm hoping that my microphone doesn't pick up the really weird low moan that you're getting with the way the wind's kind of blowing past the window. But if you can hear a weird droning noise in the background, that's all it is and there's nothing I can do about it. But anyway, we are finishing off the folklore of clothing this week and after we've done footwear and regular clothes and then accessories, we're going to finish off with outerwear and underwear. And I did say in the last episode that it would depend how much I managed to find on outerwear as to whether we did underwear. Turns out there's actually not that much. So that's why we're going to do both. So I might as well just jump straight into it. And we're going to start off with coats. And we did talk about the practice of turning your clothing inside out if you thought you'd been fairy led or pisky led in Cornwall. And the coat was obviously one of the easiest things with which to do that. It depends on the nature of the coat, clearly. I mean, I would struggle to wear my leather jacket inside out, for example. It's not the most flexible thing ever, but I do think that the overcoats of yesteryear might have been easier to wear inside out due to both their material and their construction. But that was the general idea. If you're like, hang on a minute, this isn't where I intended to be. I've been fairy led. You could then just take your coat off and turn it inside out or indeed use it as a preventative measure and go out wearing your coat inside out. Now, fastening an inside-out coat would have been difficult, and fastenings of coats also play into the superstitions, as we saw last week with the folklore of buttons, but I thought I'd include them again here because it is relevant to coats. So people considered it was bad luck to button a coat wrong. Putting old buttons on a new coat brought bad luck, but a coat with eight buttons at the front was considered lucky. People also suggested putting money into the right-hand pocket of a brand new coat to bring you good luck and more money. And this like attracts like principle appears in folklore as a form of sympathetic magic. And you see it in lots of places where it's this idea of if, if you put something here, it will attract more of it and so on. But you do have to be careful that you don't put the money in the left-hand pocket because if you do, you'll always want for money as long as you wear that particular coat. Now, the superstitions don't specify if you can just transfer the money from left to right or if putting it in the wrong pocket to start with dooms the coat. That bit I'm not quite sure about. But you also had to be careful that your coat didn't get caught up in your seat at the theatre because if it did, you'd be sorry you went. And that does seem like a bit of a melodramatic reaction to what is probably a minor inconvenience, but I'm going to assume... Somebody once went to the theatre, got their coat stuck in the seat and then had a really dreadful time and then ascribed what happened to the wrong thing. So that's probably where that came from. It was believed to indicate love if a woman picked a thread off a man's coat. She might also just have a good eye for detail. But a Pennsylvanian superstition claimed that a girl would become infatuated with you if you sewed a locket of her hair into your coat. First of all, we have to wonder how he's managed to get a locket of a girl's hair who clearly isn't infatuated with him. So that that makes that a little bit dicey to start with. But you could also just focus on being a decent guy instead of coercing someone into loving you. Just a thought. Now, courts also played a role in a fairly strange butterfly charm from Sheffield, which was recorded in 1902. And the boys would go looking for butterflies, singing a song with lyrics that read, Butterfly, butterfly, fly away home, your house is on fire and the children all gone. All but one set under a tree, writing a letter as fast as she can. It's not amazing for rhyming, I'm going to add that. But once the boys found a butterfly, they would then stop singing and they would take off their coats and then they would hold their coat by just one sleeve and then try to throw their coat over the butterfly. 
Now, the article about it in the Folklore Journal didn't actually explain why they were doing this, but it did suggest that the practice might have had a more unusual origin. So you might recognise the words as being similar to those spoken of ladybirds, and we covered those in the ladybirds episode way back when. Now, given the belief that the butterfly represents the soul, S.O. Addy suggested that the charm originally intended to capture a wandering soul to return it to its home where it was needed to deal with a calamity. The use of the coat as a makeshift net allows the charm to be used in a fairly sporadic way because obviously as long as you've got your coat on you can do it even if you just spot a butterfly when you're out. But the article didn't say what the boys actually did with any butterflies that they caught and indeed you would rather think that throwing a coat over one would likely damage its wings. So I don't recommend that one at all. I just thought it was really interesting that the coat was such a fundamental part of that particular charm. But that was literally all I could find on coats. And I was really quite shocked because I thought there would be a few more. So we're going to move on to undergarments instead. And this did require looking at the history of fashion a little bit. Because I have to admit, obviously, fashion is not necessarily my area. I do find it really interesting. But obviously, there are fashion historians for a reason. So because I wanted to see how the concept of undergarments had changed over time, I had a look at how they appeared for both men and women. So in the Middle Ages, women would wear a chemise under their dresses and that sort of got passed down to us through the concept of the slip or the petticoat, although I'm not quite sure how many people wear those now. And by the 16th century, the corset appeared and that's where you sort of see that the waist really like nipped in and the chest flattened in a lot of ways. So when you look at the earliest courses, they're very different from the ones that you tend to get now, which then emphasise sort of the S-shaped silhouette. But anyway, the corset was originally intended to alter a silhouette until the early 20th century when people largely started to discard them. The crinoline petticoat arrived in the 1830s and that's what then creates that really distinctive bell-shaped skirt while pantaloons emerged in the 1870s to cover women's calves and ankles under their dresses because at this point hemlines had started to race slightly but people were like, oh no, scandal, we can see a woman's ankle. So they brought in these pantaloons. Lingerie only really appeared in the 1920s and it was favoured by the flappers, while girdles were popular in the 1930s as a form of shapewear. So they gave the desired shape without being as restrictive as a corset. And one of the things that you've got to bear in mind where lingerie is concerned is the fact that previously people were wearing things like corsets and stuff as a form of support so they didn't really need bras and knickers and so on in the same way that we understand them now. But that's the way that obviously women's underwear has changed. And I'm not going to go into all the 20th century editions of all the different types of bras and things because it's not really necessary. It was more just to look at the changing face of underwear. And men's underwear essentially goes under quite a lot of changes as well in the sense that what were parts of men's underwear in some cases become not outerwear but regular clothing. And the men's shirt is actually one of the good examples of this. Now, nowadays, you would consider that a staple of contemporary formal wear. You know, you wear your shirt with your suit or whatever. But it was originally an undergarment, and it was often hidden by waistcoats or cravats. And if you've ever seen the classic 1995 BBC adaptation of Pride and Prejudice with Jennifer Reilly as Elizabeth Bennet and Colin Firth as Mr Darcy, that's why that scene when Lizzie encounters Darcy in a wet shirt after he's had an impromptu swim in the lake at Pemberley. That's why it's so saucy, because she'd basically just seen him in his underwear. Should point out, I did actually go to a fashion exhibition at Belsay Hall, and they had loads of Jane Austen clothes from adaptations, and they did actually have the famous Colin Firth shirt, although obviously he wasn't in it, unfortunately. But this is where that men's shirt, as I say, was originally something you wore under everything else, and then eventually it kind of moved its way outwards, to be just the thing that you wore. And the t-shirt was likewise a form of men's underwear that then ended up becoming regular wear. And it was originally worn by labourers and it was basically worn to help keep them warm and also absorb sweat. And because they were really easy to clean, it was obviously easier to wash those than it was to wash everything else that you were wearing. Now, by the 1950s, they were then adopted as regular clothing by teenagers. And this is partially thanks to the rebellious characters and stuff like Rebel Without a Cause with James Dean wearing like a white t-shirt as a piece of clothing and the rest as they say is history and yes in the 18th century men wore shapewear as well so you do get men's corsets and men girdles and things like that so whenever you see people now complaining about for example Sam Smith's clothing choices really they're just working on the level of earlier fashion that would have been completely mainstream so like just bear that in mind. Look at the dandies, I mean, they're fabulous. 
But because of all of these changes, I wanted to sort of see if that then bore out in the folklore or not. And to be honest with you, most of the superstitions that I collected from the early 20th century, or at least the turn of the 20th century, basically refer to undergarments that we would actually recognise, and they do refer to underwear. So I think it does show how the earlier ones perhaps don't really have as much sway, whereas the stuff that we'd recognise does. So, for example, losing your underwear apparently meant that your partner loved someone else. Whereas, obviously, nowadays it would be finding someone else's underwear, I would tell you that. But it was also considered bad luck to cut out the pieces for undergarments on a Friday. And if you did, they would be used to dress a corpse. People would turn their undergarments inside out to try to turn their luck during a streak of bad luck. And we'll come back to that one. But this one is quite specific. And it's if you wore two undershirts, you had to ensure the top one was longer than the one beneath. Otherwise, it meant you loved your father more than your mother. And this one reminds me of that similar superstition about petticoats, that if your petticoat was longer than your skirt, it meant you loved your father more than your mother. Now, it is suggested that this came from the fact that an observant mother would notice the difference in length, while a father wouldn't, therefore continually wearing the wrong length would suggest that you didn't have someone to point it out. But speaking of women's underwear, it seems only right to mention the cutty sock. Now, many people might know the name as that of the famous clipper ship, which you can now go and visit in Dry Dock in Greenwich, London. But the name originally comes from Robert Burns' 1791 poem, Tam O'Shanter. And in it, Tam stumbles across a coven of witches dancing. And one witch, Nanny Day, is dancing in her sock, the Scottish version of a short chemise. But Nanny got the sock as a child, so she'd obviously outgrown it and it was now too short, which explains the cutty part of the name. So Tam yells, well done, Cutty Stark, at the sight of her dancing. And Nanny Day, in her sock, then went on to become the ship's figurehead when the ship was ordered in the 1860s. And the figurehead even has her still gripping the pony's tail in one hand, the only thing that she really manages to grab during her chase of Tam. And I just think it's really interesting that this part of this Robert Burns poem then goes on to name a ship and obviously the provide the figurehead as well. So I just thought it was quite interesting to include that to show how essentially a witch is now a figurehead of a ship, which I think is quite cool. And also we've got to talk about corsets and girdles. And these are perhaps some of the most uncomfortable parts of women's underwear but there's a caveat to that because they are designed to produce a specific silhouette yes although fashion historian Bernadette Banner does bust quite a few of the myths that corsets were a tool of the patriarchy I will link the video below Bernadette is fabulous anyway I absolutely love her channel and as she's someone who has a lot of experience of actually wearing corsets on a daily basis and she's a fashion historian. I think she's really well placed to bust some of these myths. And unfortunately, this is something that you do see quite a lot. One person says a thing and then everybody just runs with it, even though that may not necessarily be true. Or indeed, the thing that the person's saying might be based on a misinterpretation. So in this case, one of the things that Bernadette busts is the difference between everyday corsetry and tight lacing, which are two very different things. So... She's saying they're not a tool of the patriarchy designed to keep women uncomfortable. And she also points out in another video that women used to play sport in corsets. Like, they really were worn as just everyday clothing. And I think part of this comes from things like that stupid scene in Titanic where Kate Winslet's being laced into her corset so tightly that she can barely breathe. That's kind of not the norm in the case of everyday corsetry. So they are a little bit different. But given that corsets and girdles were part of everyday clothing, it is hardly surprising that there would be folklore attached to them. So, for example, if your girdle broke, it meant that you'd receive a visit from a welcome guest. Now, I'm assuming that's based on Murphy's Law, or Sod's Law, whichever one you'd rather call it, that you'd see the one person you wanted to see right when you didn't feel sufficiently dressed to receive them. And dreaming of a girdle meant that you would have a successful marriage. Now, again, there were caveats. If the girdle was broken, the dream urged caution for danger was present. If the girdle was old or worn, it meant that trouble was coming. A golden coloured girdle meant wealth, a silver one meant loss, and a copper one meant happiness. And you could also see an image of your true love using this corset-based divination, because let's be honest, apparently fabulous folklore can't have an episode without there being a love divination in it. So upon going to bed, you had to remove your corset because obviously you were going to bed. You would roll it up and then you would repeat this charm three times. I roll it or roll it, I roll it up tight and hope that my true love I'll see in the night. Not in his coffin and not in his clay, but in the good clothes that he wears every day. 
And to be honest with you, again, because it's based upon using a thing that you wear every day, it doesn't require any special accoutrements or anything like that. That would be quite an easy thing to have a go at. I don't wear corsets every day, although there were times when I was in my 20s where I used to wear corsets quite a lot for going out clubbing and so on. And to be honest with you, they do provide fabulous support for your back. They do improve your posture. But I was never into tight lace and I just wanted one that looked good. So there's a tiny part of me is really tempted to try that one, you know, for science. But we can't talk about underwear and folklore and superstition without talking about lucky underwear because we did mention lucky clothing in the clothes episode, but it does bear repeating here because underwear is a really easy thing to wear to bring luck because you need to wear underwear anyway. And it's quite easy for people to kind of associate, oh no, I was wearing this particular set of underwear when my team won, so I need to keep wearing it every time they play. And indeed, a popular reason to wear lucky underwear is to help your sports team. But also we could look at something like Bridget Jones in the 2001 movie trying to choose underwear based on the desired outcome of a date. And there's almost an element of luck involved here too because according to Murphy's Law you might feel more likely to bring home your date if you're wearing hideously ugly underwear. Now I did ask about lucky underwear on Twitter and I received a range of responses and I'm going to keep most of them anonymous but one person said that they didn't wear lucky undies but that several people on the high school football team wore no underwear at all for luck and it didn't work. So there we go. Uh, Rob Saunders noted that baseball players are supposed to be the most superstitious of sports people and some don't change their underwear while they're on a winning streak and that does indeed chime with the folklore that if you put on clothes inside out you shouldn't turn them the right way or you'd turn the look. Not changing your underwear would potentially have the same effect and it's also gross but that's when I said before about if you put your underwear on inside out you weren't supposed to turn it back the right way. Again I think that potentially has some kind of link with that. Another follower said that their brother wore lucky boxes to help Everton while their partner wore red socks or a red t-shirt when crew play. Now I asked if these things worked and she said her brother stopped wearing the lucky boxes after he forgot one time and the team still won. So there we go. I I mean I was kind of asking for all of these things because like I'm not a football fan at all but because I'm from Newcastle I'm sort of duty bound to support Newcastle United sort of whether I want to or not and given they've got a fairly large game coming up I was a little bit like Do they need all the help they can get? But that's a side issue. Another reply was perhaps my favourite because a follower said that she knew someone whose lucky underpants were any pants she had been wearing when she wasn't run over because she must have been run over at some point in the past. So obviously it's like, well, any knickers I'm wearing where that didn't happen have to be lucky, which I think is quite a good way to view the whole luck thing, really. Two people said they always wore red knickers on New Year's Eve to bring good luck and or money. And someone else recommended wearing brown socks while fighting legal battles to get justice. And apparently that one did actually work, although there are other ritualistic elements at play. And finally, the other one that I got was somebody sent me a direct message to say that they'd kept their wedding underwear because it was the only time that ever wore non-black underwear. Now, they weren't intending to get married again, but they decided that they didn't want to get rid of it because they were superstitious like that. So it's interesting how we can sort of associate things with luck that may not necessarily have anything to do with it, but it's just the way that we assign meaning to things. And I think, you know, it's one of those things, it's generally relatively harmless, apart from the whole not changing your underwear. I mean, that's a bit of a weird one, but... So what do we make of lucky coats and knickers? Well, I think it's the same as everything else that we've looked at. It's the fact that you've got these items that it's quite easy to associate luck with them in that what was happening while you were wearing them. But I think it's quite interesting with the underwear ones that there's a little bit more about specific things like, oh, if this breaks or if you cut these pieces out on a given day. It's sort of a little bit less about them specifically being associated with luck but it's more the interaction with them and so much I think is quite interesting and underwear is really weird because obviously we talked about this with shoes and gloves how they mold themselves to the wearer but like underwear you're actually wearing next to your actual body like it's the closest thing to your skin and yet weirdly it doesn't necessarily seem to have a lot of the same associations that gloves and, and shoes do so I thought that was quite interesting but ultimately though whether you want to wear lucky underwear whether you want to put sort of a couple of coins in the right hand pocket of a new coat is entirely up to you as always there's no real evidence that superstition works but to be honest with you there's also not really necessarily evidence to say that it doesn't and I think if following a superstition that doesn't harm anyone else makes you generally feel better then does that really matter 
and should other people just wind their necks in. So that that's my take on it. I hope you've enjoyed this foray into the folklore of clothing because it was a lot more than I was expecting, although it's very superstition heavy rather than wider folklore heavy. So that was quite an interesting thing. Next month, we are going to be moving on to the folklore of food, mostly because obviously you've got the various things to do with whatnot, like hot cross buns and that, which I know is April, but I kind of associate that a little bit more with March. Might be because my birthday is in March, I don't know. So we'll be looking at all kinds of things. And as a, as a result of that, I will be getting the guests on to come and speak specifically about food folklore for Fabulous Folklore Presents. Speaking of which, you should hopefully also have seen that I've put out the February episode. I was going to do them every other month, but now I'm just kind of doing them sort of when I feel like it. So if they're monthly or bi-monthly, who knows? But I've done one for February and that's where I spoke to George Popoff about the side world documentaries, which look at all kinds of like folklore and ghost stories and things like that. It was really lovely speaking to him and talking about the link between folklore and filmmaking. So I've dropped the link to that in the show notes as well. So I hope that you have time to check out that particular discussion. But without any further ado, as always, thank you for the lovely reviews that have been getting posted on mostly Apple Podcasts, I think. But anyway, thank you for those. Thank you just generally for people who tweet me and say like, oh my God, I really enjoy the podcast. Like that really does mean a lot. So even if you can't financially support the podcast, just telling me that you enjoy it is really nice because it shows that this is actually you know, helping people and is a bright spot in people's day, which is kind of sort of what this is is aimed at doing in many ways. So as always, thanks for all the support and I'll see you next month when we'll have a look at the folklore of food. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee. Or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.